Good afternoon and welcome to the Gibbs Flash Forum. My name is Morris Mtumbeni, Interim Dean at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Today we are going to be having a very important conversation and I want to first begin by thanking Rabbi Gideon Pochrand, my colleague and head of the ethics think tank, who arranged for this session to take place today. Now, we talk about ethics think tank because ethics is a really important lever in society today. It's an important lever in business because we can no longer rely on focusing on the profit of business as opposed to the sustainability of business embedded with profits. Now, I'm joined today by somebody very special who has a huge impact on society in our region or in our continent. He is the CEO of PwC Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you to Mr. Dion Shango. Dion, how are you this afternoon? I couldn't be better. Uh, thank you, Morris. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Dion, we are here today <laughs> because um, we are going to be having this really important conversation. However, there's this backdrop that has been with us throughout this year, ever since we all learned this thing called Corona. <laughs> and then we, we'll, I thought there was a Corolla, but now we know <laughs> there's a Corona. And a Corona is not a city somewhere. It's actually a disease. And then there was something else called COVID. And then <laughs> it's got a number next to it, COVID-19. And we have to, we had to learn to navigate this thing called COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that we don't get sucked into a long discussion on COVID and, and I will avoid the, the most topical topic at the moment, which is the American elections. <laughs> and uh, let's quickly ask you to please help us to understand how is PwC with its 5,400 complement of employees and 181 partners, how did you navigate the COVID crisis in the early days? And where are you today? Certainly. Uh, Morris, in fact, those figures that you've just stated um, are probably uh, just under double for the staff complement across PwC Africa. That number relates to Southern Africa. And the total number of partners is just under 400, around 395. And so, yes, it did require one massive coordinated effort from us as an organization to navigate the challenges of COVID-19. Um, and from early on, we were quite clear in our minds that the, the most important thing, top of the agenda for us, was the safety, the health, and the well-being of our people. Um, without our people, there is no PwC, Morris. They personify the brand. They bring to life every single day what PwC is all about in how they interface and interact with our clients and other stake, uh, external stakeholders. And so for us, uh, most important was the safety and well-being of our people. So that is what we prioritized. Um, we did not hesitate in making sure that our people needed everything um, or had everything that they need, rather, to be able to work remotely. Um, and so closing our office was a very easy decision for us to do across uh, the continent. Um, and, and, you know, the transition or the switch to working remotely was probably um, quite seamless, in, in fact, more seamless than what I could have ever imagined. Um, you may ask why that is. Uh, many people don't know this, but organizations such as ourselves, um, the large professional services firms, we are probably experts at working remotely in the sense that we do most of our work where our clients are located. And so shifting that location from the client's premises to your own home was not really such a big switch. Yes, you would miss the interaction with the client physically, but certainly dialing in, connecting from wherever, other than your own office, was quite an easy transition for us, particularly culturally. Um, for me, it's less about the tech, the equipment, the tools and so forth. It's just the cultural and, 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 and the, the mind shift change that one has to see. 
And for that, you know, I couldn't be more proud of our people in terms of how they responded, um, in terms of how um, they did everything that we asked of them to do. Um, and an important part of that was to really look after themselves, take care of themselves, because if they don't do that, then they won't be able to look after our clients and look after their loved ones. So the emphasis was really on people and making sure that our people are safe and well-being and, and, and well taken care of. So as you know, uh, before Gibbs, I spent a significant portion of my time in financial services and a PwC is a leader in the financial services sector. And as a consequence, I have many friends in your financial <laughs> services practice. So if you don't mind, I really want to thank you uh, personally for looking after at least one of your partners, <laughs> <laughs> Rivan Rupnarayan, because I know he's still alive. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he didn't gain any weight during this period. I don't understand. But nonetheless, that's something I'll pick up with him some other time. Um, now, Clearly, it seems like the health and well-being of your people was important. I wonder if you could share what your sense is about the health and well-being of your clients, having worked with them during this period. Um, yeah. Where would you assess people like us, for example, as your clients? <laughs> it was, it, you know, it, it became very clear to us um, very quickly into the, the hard lockdowns that you had a wide spectrum. Um, of clients who were on a different point of their own respective journey in terms of being ready for this future of working remotely. Um, and the biggest challenge, as I said earlier, Morris, is just the, the cultural change um, and people having the mental wherewithal to be able to work, be effective, be productive in the absence of their broader teams and doing so remotely at home. For people to get used to the idea of, right, I'm working at home, but where are the boundaries between, between, between work life, between home, uh, and how do I strike that balance? And so certainly it was more challenging with certain clients than others. We did see um, some delays um, in the project timelines of the work that we had to carry out and execute, um, but certainly we did our best to actually hold by our clients by the hand and, and, and walk with them along this journey and to do what is necessary to help them make the transition. Um, and really for me, that is consistent with one of our five core values as PwC, um, which is the value of care. Um, so caring for our people was only one side of the coin. Caring for our clients meant that we had to do everything possible from our perspective to be patient, to be there for them, to assist them in making that switch and in making the, the transition. Um, certainly everybody has learned from this. Um, and I think many of us, you know, if you had asked me 10 months ago whether PwC would be able to carry out the audit of a large bank from start to finish, um, all done remotely, I would have said, Morris, forget it, not a chance. Um, but certainly, um, when necessity forces you into a particular position, it's incredible what human beings come out and do. Um, and they just blow you away uh, in terms of the creativity and the innovation that's brought to the table. So, by the way, I did read about your values and I paused when, when I came to the value of care. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was really curious as to what was the conversation in a PwC partner meeting when <laughs> that value found its way to the top of all yeah. the values you yeah. know because i can see the other values like integrity and 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 all of but the k1 thought okay am i reading the right integrated report here <laughs> can you just tell us a little bit about that Certainly. value of k please and i'm not surprised morris that it caught your attention yeah. because the way we depict and it's in the middle right? exactly <laughs> that's the point i wanted to make it's not in the middle by accident yeah. right and you probably wouldn't expect that from a hard technocrat type of organization like a firm of professionals, you know, auditors, consultants, tax uh, professionals. Um, but here's the story behind those five core values, actually. Um, those five values were a result of a global survey that we actually conducted amongst all of the people of PwC. Um, we came up with these values um, about five, six years ago, and the process was really simple. 
we put it to our people, you know, all 150,000 plus of them to say, right, what type of values are important to you personally? And what is it that you want the organization that you work for to be known for, right? Um, and as you can imagine, we had all sorts of um, entries and responses. And certainly these are the five that rose to the very top. And it was really, really important for us to listen to our people. And the message they were sending to us at the time was that, look, um, being the type of organization that we are, we're so performance driven. We're all about output based, seeing results, deadlines and so forth. It is really, really important to have in the midst of all of that, the ability to exhibit and demonstrate consistently, actually the caring uh, that you have for other human beings. How you care for your teams, how you care for your clients, how you care for the environment, particularly in the context of you know, ESG, sustainability and the like. And so the penny dropped for us then that actually care, something that we were probably not that well trained for, is something that's going to be crucial for the future of our business. So you discovered that accountants are people too, right? Accountants can care, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> so now let me talk a little bit to our, our people on, on, the, on the line and encourage you to post questions and to make comments and they'll somehow find their way through the ether to me <laughs> and I'll put them through to Dion. <laughs> and now uh, in honor of uh, Gideon Pokhrant, our resident rabbi, allow me to ask you this question. So I'm going to paraphrase your purpose statement and I've just focused on, on a portion of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that is uh, build trust in society. Now, that's a great aspirational and a very important purpose. Mm -hmm. The question I want to ask you is, can you take those words, those four words, build trust in society as a lens through which you could comment about your industry? Because... I'm sure whether we are looking at way back when, yeah, right, in during the scandal of the Gupta Gate, mm -hmm. right, and the role of your industry being implicated in that, or whether we're talking about all the way to Wirecard mm -hmm. in Europe, right. So it doesn't matter, and many other things in between, the the consulting industry, if I can call it that broadly, but more importantly, the assurance industry, because mm -hmm. consulting is one thing, but assurance is another, right? It's yep. That's where the trust word comes exactly. in. So exactly. how would you assess the state of your industry against those four words? Yeah. Uh, Morris, the, 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 the professional services firms um, have, all of them probably have as their roots and as the, the bedrock of their respective businesses, um, this particular responsibility of being auditors. So for more than 100 years, we have been the very guardians and custodians of all things trust related from a, a corporate financial reporting perspective. And so when we find ourselves in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and for not having fulfilled that role to the best of our ability. That is a fundamental problem. Um, it's a problem for society in that society has no one else to turn to for this particular role we're supposed to play. Um, and so we know that we have not conducted ourselves in the best possible way over the last couple of years. Building trust in society means that being trusted implicitly means that whenever somebody picks up a set of financial statements or corporate report and sees that that has been you know, uh, reviewed, audited by one of these auditing firms, they shouldn't have to wonder as to whether they can rely on the information laid out on those pages of, of the document. Um, it shouldn't have to be that they have to think to themselves, wow, I wonder whether I can still trust this firm or this organization in light of what we've experienced in the last couple of years. So certainly we need to do better as a profession. We know that we are better than what we have portrayed ourselves to be in recent times. Um, and there's work to be done. 
uh, trust has been eroded, confidence has been lost by society, and certainly as a profession we need to do as much as we can to invest as much as possible into the whole um, issue of quality. For that reason, um, when I took on this role, my leadership team and I actually made a conscious decision to make quality, and not only audit quality, but quality is all in all its forms, the cornerstone of our strategy and the backbone of the journey that we want to go on over a four, five year period. Certainly, um, I can share with you that in my interactions with my colleagues at other firms, they share that passion of saying, yes, we need to do better, we need to be better as a profession. For that reason, here in South Africa, um, about two years ago, just over two years ago, um, convened by the Auditor General uh, at the time, Kimi Makwetu, um, the profession actually came together and embarked on a journey of actually coming out with some proposed reforms and changes that will allow us to see the type of improvements in quality that are needed in this country. Um, there is risk to this process in that if it is the profession doing it only for the profession, it could be perceived as being self-serving. Um, and for that reason, we are in a process of reaching out to all of the stakeholders to this profession and other role players in the financial reporting ecosystem to get their inputs, to get th their guidance as to what it is through their eyes um, needs to be done by the profession in order to enhance, improve, and demonstrate better quality. I mean, there. Professor Wiseman Kuklu has written a, a, a book recently. It's very hard hitting mm. to paraphrase maybe at an industry level as opposed to the specific company. He, the question is asks, are you a victim or a villain? Right? It's a very important question and he challenges this notion of what he calls the economic man um, and, and how the economic man is driven by primarily the profit motive. And mm -hmm. let's be clear, this is a business school, it's not the school of theology, <laughs> so I love profit, right? So I don't want to be misunderstood, I love profit. <laughs> La profit is the lifeblood of business and business is the lifeblood of society. So I'm pro-profit. However an excessive focus on profit mm. seems to be, according to Professor Nkutlu, at the root of the evil that is besetting the industry. How, as an industry, beyond those reforms, can you give us something practical that y you, are, you are doing as opposed to what you have committed at an industry level mm -hmm. to help us to just get in a little bit and have an understanding of what is different, you know? Yeah. yeah. In the context of Professor Nkutlu's book, Morris, um, certainly over time, I would say that the narrative around why people actually choose auditing in particular as a career um, has probably, you know, become a bit loose. What do I mean by that? Um, in how youngsters are taught at school about the value or opportunity presented by being a chartered accountant in this country. Um, has really uh, been too overweight on the financial incentive and the rewards recognition that come with such a particular um, qualification. And so when young people think about a chartered accountant, uh, more often than not, they perceive it to be this profession whereby if you qualify, you will probably be well remunerated financially, which is fact, which is fair. Um, and what we don't put any emphasis on is that actually these chartered accountants and those in particular that are in public practice or doing auditing as a living um, are actually there for the public interest. I mean, that is a fundamental, fundamental principle. We are there to ensure that there is trust in the capital markets and that people can rely on the work that is performed by auditors to provide them with the assurance, with the comfort, with the trust that whatever information they are evaluating, assessing in the process of decision making, more often than not decision making that affects their livelihoods. Yeah?
yeah. is something that is underpinned by the work of, of auditors. And so there's simply no room for anybody to doubt the quality of that work, to doubt that in how we, we fulfilled our duty, we complied fully with the standards that are expected of us, international standards, uh, that is. Um, and so this is something that is fundamental for me that we need to go back and teach differently about why people join this profession um, and certainly in how we are interacting with schools as an organization. Um, you, you speak about practical things. We, we are changing the, the narrative and making sure we land the message differently. Certainly, speaking broader as an industry um, and the work that SAPTI is doing, one of the stakeholders that we have identified is indeed academia and the universities. And we want to influence the process and the curriculum of how students at university are taught about what auditing is actually about and this duty of the public interest. We think that that has been understated for far too long and it is a critical part of the recipe of how we, we improve and enhance the, the mindset of quality in this profession. So one of the people on the line, I think her name is Zama Zwane, yeah? She's talking about greetings to you, Mr. Shango. Ethics, or rather corporate ethics, to be specific, is in steep decline in our corporations that run in South Africa. What are your views and how are you and how are your beliefs structuring that? So perhaps in answering that, and as we we're going to transition to a different set of questions, you could possibly talk to the PwC transparency report, which mm -hmm. perhaps is a useful tool that maybe other organizations should be thinking of yeah. producing. What Absolutely. is this transparency report yeah. and how does it work? So the transparency report is a, an annual record of how we have managed um, our quality systems, uh, processes, controls as an organization um, over a 12 month period. We produce it to coincide with our financial year. Um, which runs from July to June every year. And hence, we launched it a couple of years ago in relation to the year ended 30 June um, 2020. In there, you will get um, a detailed account of how we have performed um, in our own quality evaluation and, and management as an organization. And that relates to how our quality compliance was assessed, reviewed, tested by external stakeholders, i.e. audit regulators. The main regulator here in South Africa is the IRBA, as you know. Um, in there you get um, a record of how we performed against our own internal quality inspections and reviews. Um, in addition to that, you get very useful information about how we are investing in education. Um, education in the form of bursaries that we give to students that are interested in applying, um, in, in joining this profession or coming to work for us as PwC. Secondly, and very, very importantly, the amount um, of money investment that we expend towards the training and development of our own people. Because what people don't get out there is that, uh, or what people often, often uh, miss out there is that once you become a chartered accountant, the learning doesn't stop there. It is a continuous process of personal learning development uh, and training that will actually keep you up to date with the challenges that a chartered accountant is exposed to all the time. And so the challenges that are faced by a chartered accountant today are different from those that would have been faced by a chartered accountant of five years ago, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so that process of, of continuous learning which I'm sure you'll be passionate about by virtue of the line of work you are in, Morris, um, is something that is critical and core to making sure that our professionals, our accountants and auditors are at the, uh, auditors are at the cutting edge um, and have all the skills and capabilities that they need to be able to address risk which is getting more and more complicated at our clients uh, every single day. So let's talk about the skills. So um, you talk about uh, uh, one of the big shifts that has taken place in the past few years within PwC is this notion of digital upskilling in, 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 in the journey towards digitalization. 
and uh, counterbalanced around this notion of uh, being well means working well. Um, what is all of that about and how does it fit into what we, I suppose, incorrectly call the future world of work when it is actually the now world of work? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it's interesting you talk about the future world as opposed to, to the now world because uh, I always say to our people that, you know, when you think about the future, the future isn't some random point in time, three, four, five years from now. The future is, is, is actually now. Um, at best, the future is tomorrow. Uh, and so I think sometimes this word of future is, is misused or misunderstood um, uh, to the very least. Um, for me, it's quite simple, Morris, in that when people think about digital upskilling, when people think about the future of work or workforce of the future, people immediately switch to thinking technology, um, the various technologies that um, have been elevated these days, things like AI, robotics, um, uh, um, blockchain and the like. Actually, um, digital upskilling and the future workforce is about people. It's not about the tech or the kit or the fancy tools. It's about people. It's about the mindset of people and being open to embracing new ways of working, to leveraging the power and the opportunity presented by these tools that have proliferated over the last couple of years um, and actually using them to, number one, enhance quality and to drive creativity and innovation. So for me, at the center of the digital upskilling narrative is people. You, you make these investments with a particular goal in mind regarding what do you want to achieve for your people. And so as PwC, yes, you're absolutely right, we are on a digital upskilling journey. We felt that this was an investment we needed to make in our people. And as PwC Africa, um, we began on this journey uh, probably about um, a year ago, 15 months ago now where we want to equip our people with uh, the skills, the tools, and the knowledge that they will need in order to thrive in a much more digital world. Um, how did we do that practically? Um, we required of everybody to um, uh, take on uh, a training courses in tools such as uh, Altrix and Power BI, which would be you know, tools that we wouldn't normally use um, every day but these are more new age tools that we wanted to expose our people to. In addition to that, there was training on AI um, and other uh, types of technologies. You just use like rattle the few acronyms. So can we backtrack? Altrix is? Um, it's, it's really a visualization tool. Power um, BI? Power BI is very similar. You use it to analyze data and the like. Okay. Um, and so these are tools that will allow us to be much more efficient, yeah. um, much more effective in what we do with data. So it's, um, it's, it's humanizing the technology, humanizing the data. Making it easier to interpret the data and provide much higher quality insights to our clients and yeah. for ourselves. So well. talking about people, what I really found encouraging and intriguing is this notion where you're talking about our people as in the people inside, but then you then took your digital fitness app and you said it's, a, it's also the people outside. So. Talk to us about the strategy around the digital fitness app. Yeah. So that was part of an initiative we called New World, New Skills. So I spoke about our inter internal digital upskilling journey. Um, and the name we use here at PwC Africa is Our Tomorrow. Um, different firms of PwC across our global network use different strap lines. Um, but soon after embarking on this journey of Our Tomorrow, we realized, um, and we realized that it, it is not enough to simply upskill our own people inside of PwC. And that as a global network, with a purpose statement that talks about solving important problems, we have a duty and a responsibility to make sure that everybody comes along. And so the digital upskilling of the communities where we have footprint as PwC is something that we have called new world, new skills. So this is the contribution we want to make together with other role players and stakeholders in society to make sure that nobody gets left behind 
and the, the communities in which we, we, we live and work are actually given access to the same upskilling opportunity. So the DFA, the Digital Fitness app, is an app that we made available for free. Um, you can download it from, from uh, the, the App Store or Google Play. Um, and it is really a tool that you can use to initially measure your digital fitness. In other words, um, how uh, proficient you are in all things digital and technology related. I can just tell you, I, I, I would fail. No, There's don't a write yourself off. Luddite, <laughs> Luddite, that's me. So <laughs> how it works. I'm the of the Luddite Society. <laughs> how it works is that you start by doing an assessment. It gives you a score. Yeah. But here's the really cool part. What it does then, it, um, it suggests or proposes certain courses that you can take, right? And these are not long courses. It can be things as easy as little five or ten minute tidbits that you do on a daily basis that will help increase your digital, digital fitness score. And so the more of these tasks um, that you do that, that are allocated to you, you get the opportunity to improve your digital upness and the higher your score gets, then it means you're getting more and more fit from a digital perspective. So we're doing gamification. So I go. also read, because I'm a client of, of PwC in other respects and also here at Gibbs, that you have something called Aura Platinum. That's something you use for our benefit. Something called Connect, again, something you use for our benefit. Halo and Count. So clearly there's these digital, let me say, capabilities, uh, products mm. that you use that you've developed as an interface between the work that you do and people like us so that you can share knowledge internally you can ensure quality of work is taking place and so forth but what be, what i'd be really inter interested in is really understanding what sits behind that so i learned recently something called a digital stack <laughs> so what sits be what is your digital digital stack that sits behind this mm. that supports um, your your digitalization journey because I think when we're talking about digital, we're talking about all manner of different things mm. in an organization, mm. not just one or two big technologies. Yeah, certainly the ones that you've mentioned, Morris, are all the tools that we use at the client interface. So how we physically carry out the work that we do every day. Um, some of those are tools that we use to, to document and store the work that we do. You spoke about Aura Platinum. Um, Connect is a collaboration tool that we use to exchange information and data with our clients in a safe and secure environment. Um, and Halo is uh, something we use within Aura uh, as something that helps us to test journal entries, for instance, um, testing 100% of, of a particular population of data. Um, so behind that, to your question, um, from about four years ago, we actually uh, started a journey of evolving our back office systems and technology tools. Um, we switched from using Lotus Notes as our main email and communication platform um, to Google and Gmail. But so, that's so that not something you now. should be proud of. You know, Lotus Notes <laughs> died like 50 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> we, 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 we eventually made the jump. <laughs> it's funny you say that. You'd be, su you'd be surprised at the number of people I, I am who surprised. actually <laughs> were, you know, wedded to Lotus Notes. And will tell you that uh, no other tool had the same security features as Lotus Notes. I can understand. You know, when I was in financial <laughs> services in the early 90s, we still had a green screen and Lotus <laughs> Notes died when proper email came with uh, Microsoft in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, and every now and again, I hear these Luddites talking about yeah. Lotus Notes. And Does that product still exist? Exactly. It's still <laughs> around. Yeah, it's still around. Very much so. Yeah. Um, the second one, uh, quite crucial for us. Uh, our main client relationship management or CRM tool is Salesforce. Yeah. Uh, something that we've seen as a game changer in that what it's given us the ability to do for the first time since using Salesforce is that, you know, by the very nature of our business, um, a lot of analysis about what we are about requires you to look back all of the time. But with Salesforce, for the first time, we were actually able to run and manage our business looking through the windscreen in front of us rather than looking at the rear view mirror. So, so Salesforce was something um, that's, that's really been a game changer for us. In addition to that, in terms of our, uh, the main ERP system that we use uh, to manage our operations,
for our financial uh, reporting um, is Oracle Cloud, uh, something that we um, implemented in 2018. So those would be, you know, the three main uh, transformational shifts we, we've, um, we, we, we've made in terms of adopting new tools. Last but not least, um, PwC is a, is a people business um, at the end of the day, and so our human capital management system, um, we use Workday, and that is something we've also adopted in the last couple of years. So all of those tools or platforms are cloud-based, cloud-enabled, uh, and that's really consistent with the shift that we see across the world of more and more people moving into the cloud. Moving into the cloud was a, an important investment for us. Um, I believe that it is part of the reason why we made the transition to working remotely um, during COVID lockdown, um, such an easy one for us. Uh, and, and so we, we are delighted at having made the investment and we are really rev leveraging those investments today. Yeah. So talking about re working remotely, thank you for that. I'll come back to the technology question. So let me honor some of the questions. So Megi Kwena Maubela says, on average, is remote work working more effective than client-based or office-based working? That's the first question. And then whilst you're thinking about that, Andrea Lekhanyane uh, says, uh, will you be terminating most of your property lease agreements nationally? <laughs> <laughs> she might be your landlord. <laughs> <She> <laughs> <laughs> I need to be careful what I say here. Um, shall I start with Andrea's question yes. uh, first? Yeah. Uh, certainly, we, we are taking a long, hard look at our entire real estate portfolio. Uh, and certainly you, you hear lots of opinions out there about this new normal, um, about the emergence of a hybrid model, whereby uh, people will more and more work sometime from home and sometime come into the office. Uh, I'm still a big proponent of uh, people coming in and physically interacting with their colleagues. Uh, currently, we have not required or forced our people to come back to the office. Uh, what we are trying to do is encourage them as strongly as we can to build a cadence of coming in, say, you know, three or four times a week. Uh, but certainly there is an opportunity to downscale our real estate currently. And we are looking at that as to how, how best to, to, to do that. Um, then moving on to, to the first question, just remind me what the question was. Remote again. working. Re remote. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it the remote working? Is so it better or not? So... We, throughout lockdown, we've performed what we've called pulse surveys, Morris. Um, yeah. And the purpose of those pulse surveys um, really was, it was part of the initiatives of, of ensuring the safety and well-being of our people. Uh, those surveys indicated that about 80% of our people were able to be effective and work well remotely. Um, about 10% uh, of our people um, preferred being in the office and the last 10% really, really struggled with the notion of working alone, working at home. So um, the words used in the question were on average. Certainly most of our people have been comfortable to do that, but I'm a big, once again, I'm a big proponent of people actually collaborating in person physically in one space from time to time. So, so yes, productivity has been maintained um, during remote working, but I strongly believe that in the, in the line of work that we are in, um, in terms of how it is so important for us to feed off one another's um, energy and company and really collaborate, be creative in the same spaces is still a critical part of how we, we achieve our best results as an organization. Yeah. Okay, so my colleague, um, maybe building on that, my colleague Ngao Mutsei uh, says, uh, consulting is said to be high touch. In your opinion, what's your opinion about consulting in the digital era? What long-term impact do you think it will have on the consulting business model? Consulting, consulting is a tough, tough game. Um, and consulting is getting more and more competitive every year. The challenges we see in the market is that as a PwC, you compete against your fellow multinational firms and you compete with somebody who runs a one-man shop. Um, and so delivering value to a client is something that is ever-evolving. 
um, how people consulted five, ten years ago has changed. I think important to, to remember is that it has to go beyond the digital, right? Uh, certainly what we are hearing from our clients is that the type of problems that we are facing is getting more and more complex. Uh, we don't expect you to have all of the answers, uh, but how do you best position yourself and work together with us so that together we can come up with some workable solutions that would ideally um, uh, add value to us. Um, yes, there is an expectation that firms such as ours are expected to be a lot more digital in how we deliver those services. Clients want it faster, cheaper, more standardized, um, and that really has become the name of the game. But much more important about just, you know, the, the platforms or the channels that you use to deliver the services. At the end of the day, the question that you need to answer is, have you really added value to the client um, as promised? And have you solved the fundamental problem for that particular client? Lovely. So one of the questions is, takes, is taking us back to this value of care. And this comes from, I'm going to acknowledge, I think it's a her. Uh, and ironically, senior consultant is her title. Ndileka <laughs> Pelela Makaluza. She says, what actions has PwC taken in line with its value of care, especially in the current economic climate? I imagine her question is, um, how have you... Uh, thought about your employees mm. uh, around the economics um, given that this has not been an easy year how have you thought about the communities in terms of your social responsibility um, and uh, your role in things like solidarity fund mm. your role in in in, in 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 those types of solidarity activities yeah what has pwc been up Certainly. to there so shortly after the start of lockdown, Morris, um, I think it was at the beginning of April or so, um, I sent communication out to the entire PwC Africa to the effect that um, notwithstanding the economic uncertainty that is expected um, as a result uh, of COVID-19 um, and the pandemic, uh, all the lockdowns we were seeing across the continent, we gave our people the commitment that nobody would be retrenched, right? So we wanted to provide certainty in the minds of our people that everybody's job was safe and secure. That is a commitment that we gave and that we continue to stick to even in this new financial year um, through to June 2021. And we made that conscious decision even in the midst of um, a much more adverse uh, economic outlook for us as a business. And so what that means practically is that the owners and managers of the business, of the firm, in the form of the partners, the 400 odd partners I spoke to earlier, actually took it upon themselves that they will withstand whatever hit that is taken by the business, whatever loss that is incurred, and will not on transfer that to our people in the form of layoffs, uh, retrenchments and the like. Um, together with that, certain sec sectors of our employee base uh, get the opportunity to, uh, to, be, to participate in a bonus scheme, whereas a number of organizations out there actually suspended and didn't pay any bonuses. We saw through that commitment and paid a bonus in the month of September. Um, certainly, um, the one thing that we did defer or freeze are annual increases uh, or promotions. And that was probably the counter to ensuring that we are indeed able to keep everybody and, and not retrain, retrench anyone. You spoke about um, the role we may have played to the external environment, broader society. Uh, you're 100% correct, uh, Morris. We have been asked, we've been appointed to be the auditors of the Solidarity Fund. That is a role that we play pro bono, so we don't get paid a fee for that. And that is something that was really, it was, we didn't even bat an eyelid. Um, we, were, we were called, we were asked, we said, without doubt, that's something that we as PwC feel that we, we could do. Um, at other platforms like Business for South Africa, we use the opportunity to, to once again deploy senior resources, including partners, to play a role to assist government 
and the private sector um, in the procurement um, of PPE and, and really brought to the fore our skills, capabilities to ensure that that process was done uh, efficiently and effectively. Again, work that we carried out pro bono um, and I was really proud of the way in which um, some of the influential figures at Business for South Africa and some of our competitors for that matter saying that, listen, the work that PwC has carried out was outstanding. So, so really, really proud of our people. Lovely. So talking about that and, and the leadership agenda, um, so what is on your leadership agenda? You know, um, and, and as you're thinking about that, I also would like you to reflect on what certainly has been on the leadership agenda of many people and has defined global geopolitics, this notion of diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. an identity being seen, being heard, being allowed to breathe. Mm. All right? mm -hmm. uh, so what is on your leadership agenda and how does your leadership agenda stack up to the diversity and inclusion agenda? Yeah. So for me personally, it's really important that at PwC, everybody feels at home. It's important for me that at PwC, everybody feels that they can bring the best of themselves every single day. Everybody feels that they are in an environment that is conducive for them to, to give their best, to be inspired, to inspire others. Um, nobody at PwC should have to feel like a second class citizen. Yeah. Um, and so how do we go about doing that? We go about doing that by painstakingly building and developing a certain type of culture. Um, my view, Morris, is that culture defines the type of organization that you are. And this is probably the most difficult aspect of leadership, is influencing people to behave in a particular way but to also do so consistently, uh, to do so when things are going well, to do so when there's adversity along the way. Um, and what tools do we have to be able to achieve that? Uh, yet again, I fall back on the five core values that I shared with you earlier, or at least I touched on the care uh, value. Um, those values are a check and balance, uh, a benchmark for us to remind us how we are expected to behave towards one another, how we are expected to behave towards our clients um, and other stakeholders. And so that is really, really important for me that one of the legacies that I leave as a leader of this Africa firm is the type of culture I was able to inculcate and foster amongst our people. You ask the dimension of, you asked about the dimension of inclusion and diversity. Again, something that is very close to my heart. Uh, I form part of what is called the Inclusion and Diversity Council of uh, the PwC network. Um, that is a platform that has been formed by our global chairman of PwC, Bob Moritz, to evolve and move forward the inclusion and diversity strategy of PwC globally. Um, and r that really gives me the opportunity to use my voice much more constructively and in uh, an influential way to really advance uh, and advocate uh, the whole narrative around inclusion and diversity. We have targets, we have goals for PwC Africa that we have set, and those goals have never become, have never been um, as important as they are uh, right now in the context of, you know, the recent events you've alluded to, Black Lives Matter, um, LGBT+, plus, um, and other initiatives for people saying that they want to be seen, they want to be heard. Uh, and so this is really a critical part of our strategy as PwC Africa, inspiring our people and making sure that we create the type of environment where everybody feels at home and feels that they are able to give their best, regardless of who they are, what they look like, um, how they identify as individuals, or where they come from. Well, thank you. So talking about uh, 
Africa not being a country, but being a continent, I wonder if you could just paint some color for us around, or colors, let's rather say, around the similarities, differences, surprises about operating, is it in 26 countries? So it's about 16 countries. 16 countries, yep. 16. So Miss yep. Red, I knew there was a six somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so give us a sense of, because PwC South Africa is not the same as PwC Kenya, for example, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so just give us a sense about what are the interesting things that yeah. one learns in each of the countries in, yeah. that you operate in? Yeah. In what I learned yesterday, because in South Africa we call it South Africa and the rest of Africa. <laughs> and, and, and I was in a webinar with Kenyan colleagues and, and, and they said, Kenya and the greater Africa. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> so I learned it's not the rest, it's the greater. So yeah. I am adopting the greater Africa. Certainly, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Uh, so... so Allow me, Morris, to disagree with you slightly when you say the countries are so different from one, from one another ah, from a PwC perspective. Uh, certainly, the, the type of culture we have as an organization is that if you were to pluck out somebody from Johannesburg and put them in Nairobi or drop them off in Lagos and ask them to start operating, uh, everything that they need, that they are used to, um, that they expect to have in order to be effective. They should be able to find in Nairobi, Lagos, Accra, wherever that may be. Um, and the most important aspect of that is the culture. The very culture I spoke of earlier is a culture that we are driving and building across the continent. And so my answer to you is PwC Kenya, PwC Tanzania, PwC Ghana, PwC Nigeria, are only as different from PwC South Africa um, as it relates to the fact that they are part of the country of Nigeria or the country of, of Kenya. That is the only difference. Certainly, the type of client challenges that we see are the same. Um, the type of businesses uh, that we run, the skills and capabilities that we offer the market are the same. Uh, the economic challenges of the various countries may differ and have slight nuances here and there. If you operate in Nigeria, for instance, the impact of the oil price on the economy is something that is always top of mind for you. Yeah. So what, what um, accounting standard do you use? To <laughs> 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 well, I, I love that question in that ultimately the accounting considerations are the same. Yeah. <laughs> regardless of industry. Yeah. Uh, regardless of... So uh, IFRS 9 in, in oil rich countries countries like Nigeria with fluctuations is the same as, as a poor country bank, like South Africa. There you go. <laughs> or the banking industry in South Africa. Yeah. The same rules apply. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is the beauty of, of, of our model, th that we get to be able to, to practice our skills and showcase them regardless of where we are uh, in, in this continent. Um, and in fact, Morris, I can, I can extend and expand that regardless of where you are in the world. Uh, and that is the beauty of our business model. Yeah. So as we're coming to an end, um, I would like you to reflect on these four words that I found really interesting and help us to understand how they undergird or underpin your ethical foundation as PwC. And those words are predict, prevent, learn, reinforce. Mm. Mm. Predict, learn, prevent, reinforce. Yeah. So, so even b before I come to the four words, Maros, let me say this about ethics. Um, where the world is today, ethics has gone beyond just being the responsibility of the particular corporate organization that you are part of. Um, companies, organizations around the world are investing millions and millions of dollars into so-called ethics programs, Morris. But for me personally, what is ethics all about? Ethics is about what I teach my three teenage children at home every day. And I think this is part of the reason why, I think it was Zama who asked the question that corporate ethics is just on a constant decline that is where we have gotten it wrong as a society. Um, and that is what for me is important 
uh, if we are ever to get the ethics right. And it goes beyond just the auditing profession. Um, it goes far wider than that into the corporate reporting ecosystem, other role players in the financial reporting chain. So, you know, the, the CFOs and finance functions that we have to work with as auditors, um, it goes to broader society and how we as a society, as a country, view ethics. Uh, and I always, you know, like to share this analogy. Um, how many times when you are driving, um, you come up, you're coming, uh, approaching uh, a set of robots, it's amber and you go through. And two, three seconds later, the car behind you also goes through that robot um, after it's already gone red. And that has become okay in our society. We don't see anything wrong with that. And it's those small little things that change every day that we just somehow accept as human beings, as citizens. Um, that for me uh, calls our, our ethics framework um, to, to just deteriorate uh, and get worse by the day. So what we do personally, how we teach those that come after us is, is important. So prevent, predict, certainly we have programs, we have structures that ensure that our people are able to speak up every time that um, they see or experience something unethical happening. Um, whistleblower lines, all of those things that form part of the corporate speak that, that forms part of uh, an organization today. Yes, those are important. Yes, we have them as PwC, just like any other organization or, or competitor of ours. But ultimately, the ethics narrative, the ethics discussion has to start with self and, and, and how we can show what we are doing um, to practice ethics every day and to influence ethical behavior every day. I think that's a very good place to stop. And let me give you a message from a very jealous person who doesn't share this one thing that you and I share, Dion, that no one can take away from us. We are both University of Pretoria graduates. <laughs> <laughs> and this one guy uh, wrote and he says, proud of alumnus Dion Shango, his name is our Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so he's watching and enjoying prof, this conversation. Prof Kupe, a good friend, a good friend. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Dion, thank you for allowing us to get to know you, thank the you. person behind the title that represents so much that is interested in solving problems that matter in a way that builds trust in society. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.